Welcome to the Soothsight podcast. I'm Christopher Dole, co-founder of Soothsayer Analytics, and my guest today is Derek Kane, head of advanced analytics at Gaia Group. Based in Germany, Gaia is one of the world's largest suppliers of food processing technology, machinery, plants, and components. Derek holds a master's in predictive analytics from Northwestern and has worked in data science for nearly two decades. He is the definition of a unicorn, being equally adept at building and implementing cutting edge AI solutions while also maintaining a deep understanding of the business. Derek is a longtime friend and collaborator, so I have seen firsthand the brilliance that he brings to the table. What really sets him apart, though, is his approach to servant leadership, where he empowers those around him by emphasizing collaboration and mutual knowledge transfer. He is also a concert musician that brews his own beer and practices archery, a, a true jack of all trades. I should also call out his data science lecture series, which can be found at Derek Kane Data Science on YouTube. Derek, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for the opportunity um, to talk today. So the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, the only constant is change. There are so many groundbreaking innovations just in the last year, and the dynamics of what data science will be are rapidly changing. What do you see as the most significant developments in the global AI landscape, and what has you most excited right now? Oh, I would say the number one innovation that everyone is talking about are these uh, large language models and the tech war that we're now starting to see on how uh, companies are utilizing um, this AI technology, um, both in the data science machine learning context, but also um, you know, across um, an entire uh, swath of different um, disciplines in the company. That, um, and if you look at the rate of change um, that has happened in the last couple of years, I mean, we've had the constant involvement of uh, GPT um, to GPT-3 um, from OpenAI, and some of its capabilities early on were absolutely fascinating. And uh, and then just in one year's time, you have 3.5, which uh, contains you know, some guardrails. OK, uh, this idea of reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is a fascinating idea and kind of a policy framework for working with the AIs. And uh, just what ChatGPT has been able to do with the GPT mechanism, um, it just shows you that it is an absolute game changer. So you mentioned some good points there. Reinforcement learning, chat GPT, large language models, uh, Langchain is another one that that's all the rage, right? So it seems like very few people, you know, obviously everybody's excited by it, but very few people understand what these things are and how they work. So maybe you could just take a minute to explain this to a layman and why it's so important. Yeah, so the first time anyone gets into uh, a chat GPT, and you open up uh, the prompt and you ask your first question and it just magically is uh, spitting out the result. One question that I have is, um, how does this work? And can you get the system to do other things? So you speak to it in, um, not in computer code, but in just normal, uh, normal English. And it's behind the scenes, it's trying to determine exactly what you're asking it to do. And then it uh, um, creates the response. So the technology um, that is used for working with uh, large language models that is emerging on the space is what's called LangChain. And LangChain, um, the concept um, is fairly simple, but it's actually a very complicated uh, system. But you have this idea of uh, prompts, system prompts, agents, and things of this nature. So I'll give you an example. When you go to ChatGPT, and in the very first prompt, you can say things like, um, uh, if I am asking a question, I want you to respond in German. And then you hit enter and it says, okay, I will um, respond now in German. And then all subsequent commands you're giving the AI, um, now it should um, show you in German. This is what we call prompt engineering, okay? And um, we're creating kind of a system level rule OK, uh, and the system level rule uh, acts as a guardrail for working with the AI. Um, 
But underneath, you might um, have additional rules or additional commands that you want the AI to do. Okay, and these are, um, you put them into the prompt, you specify the rules of the game, if you will, and you're connecting um, aspects of um, your system prompts and your, uh, your lower level prompts into chains of prompts. And this is um, an entirely new discipline that's um, coming um, and we call this, um, um, I would call it like AI engineering and I would call it also prompt engineering. Okay, and, and LangChain is the open source technology um, that is powering this. And I would expect to see a number of applications come out um, in 2023 and 2024. Can you, can you discuss any like specific data science initiatives or projects that, that you're spearheading and you know what kind of impact they have on the business? Like for instance, I believe you're building your own version of a, let's say a chat GPT POC specific to your company, right? But so what's that all about? Yeah, so so my company uh, is really focusing on advancing the analytics in a number of areas. Um, being um, a process uh, technology and engineering company, um, we have a lot of focus in the IIoT space, which we can talk about a little later. Um, but if you just look inside a company's operations, you know, in supply chain, in finance, um, HR, you know, these are uh, functions that all companies um, have. And some of the data science work that we're doing um, in kind of the conventional space is related to forecasting. So, um, you know, what are, is my order intake going to be? What are, is my revenue um, going to be? We have um, some exploratory work we're doing in um, behavioral segmentation. So we call this some um, customer 360. Um, so understanding, you know, how our customers interact um, with our company. And uh, and the big one that you know we're now starting to dive into research is a chat GPT, GPT prototype, where can we use this um, new AI technology um, to speed up uh, um, knowledge discovery and information retrieval? But there's going to be a whole host of additional you know kind of ancillary use cases that will come from it. <laughs> you you briefly mentioned it too for a second, but I know that you're a true expert in things like pricing and forecasting. So anything that you can add there? Yeah, so forecasting is very, very interesting. You know, uh, companies want to be able to predict things. You know, you want to be able to predict, you know, how your business is going to act and behave. Um, so if you're just getting into forecasting, okay, as a discipline, um, start with simple methods, start with um, univariate time series. Um, get comfortable with how they work and how to supplement them in the decision making process. But once you have that kind of solidified, then you can move into uh, more interesting areas like multivariate techniques. And then you get into the class of machine learning algorithms, deep learning frameworks, and, you know, and all those fun ones. But walk before you run, start with the simple ones and then build up from there. When so you work for a, a massive global manufacturer and so and you kind of mentioned IoT earlier. So what does this mean? What does industry 4.0 mean in the context of Gaia and how is your industry making use of sensors and industrial IoT more broadly? Yeah, and um that's a great question and um it's a complicated question. Industry 4.0 is a, a huge concept, but in our company, we break down digitalization into two major areas. We have our internal digitalization, and then we have our external facing digitalization. And our external um, digitalization is spearheaded on by our chief um, digital officer, um, Tom Olsner. And in this group, um, he is working on basically strengthening the capabilities of our divisions and um, working um, to bring um, a, a a progression of different types of use cases in the IIoT space. So when you when you think about it logically, um, uh, we sell equipment, okay, um, to our customers, and our customers use this equipment um, to produce their goods and services. So we have a, a Gia Cloud, which is based in an Azure environment. Um, it's actually a multi-cloud solution. Um, so we do some partnerships with SAP, but in our cloud, we need to connect to our equipment. And we need to bring data from our equipment up into our cloud. 
And then you can get into conventional IIoT uh, and industry 4.0 metrics like OEE, um, condition monitoring, you can move into anomaly detection, and you can start to get into some predictive prescriptive analytics. But a real challenge that we have is um, there are some uh, um, technologies that we've built over the years that um, have the uh, latency requirements. So if you remember, Chris, um, uh, many years back, um, we went um, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and, uh, and the team out there um, works in our um, LPT division, okay, so our liquid and process technology division, and they have a really fantastic solution um, that they call um, OptiPartner. And it is basically process optimization that is done um, at the machine level. And if you think about sending data up to your cloud, get it to produce some signals and then send the data back okay, to the machine, um, the amount of time it takes to do this um, uh, might not be fast enough. And then add some further complications like will our customer even allow us to use their network? Okay, um, you know, maybe they have some security requirements. You all of a sudden have a whole different host of challenges you have to deal with. And what Kia has done is um, for certain types of products, we do um, direct cloud connectivity. So just condition monitoring, how's the machine running, you know, things like this. But our really high performance industry 4.0 um, and IIoT work might re require um, compute at the edge. So we'll have industrial PCs that we bring to the client site that run optimization locally with you know, advanced algorithms and you know, you know, all, all the sort. Um, but for us, uh, um, the general philosophy is try to get our data safely and securely into our cloud, where then you know, our team of data scientists and engineers you know, can um, start to turn it into value. How do you see then the, the role of, of data science evolving in manufacturing and how is Gaia preparing for all of these changes that you were just alluding to? Oh, oh, it's absolutely fantastic right now. Um, so on one end, you have ChatGPT, where uh, this technology, if you ask it um, to produce code samples, um, it is a, a, a very capable coding system already. So. A data scientist, when they work, are now, instead of worrying about the syntax of Python or R or Spark, um, they can just go you know, straight to this AI and get exactly what they need um, when they need it. So that functionality is here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, so their productivity is now greatly increased Okay, um, by not having to deal with you know, um, the insignificant work. Um, on the other end, we're now going to see what I would call citizen data scientists who are um, more kind of hobbyist ones who maybe don't have the rigorous background in statistics or computer programming um, or the business understanding. Maybe they're software developers by trade wanting to get into the machine learning space. Um, and there's a danger related to this because, um, you know, how do you know if your algorithm is good? Um, how do you evaluate its performance? You know, these are um, these are important areas of the data scientist's um, workload that you know now has to somehow be translated to a citizen um, developer. But but I see um, AI supplementing um, the data scientist in a number of ways, and um, as kind of like the ultimate productivity tool. I want to come to that, back to this point because there's some important stuff there. But as I mentioned in the intro, I've seen firsthand how you tend to get involved with a lot of these you know, really cutting edge applications of AI. So how do you balance the need for innovation and risk taking with maintaining strict compliance and regulatory standards? Yes, and uh, my company is based in Germany, in Dusseldorf. And as a German um, publicly traded corporation, um, there is a number of topics that we take very seriously. Um, for example, we take security um, seriously, um, data protection, and making sure um, that you know, we're dealing with all of the compliance requirements for the, um, for the various countries we operate in. So some of these um, uh, changes that we see in regulations okay, across the globe um, have to be translated down to the product. 
So if we're developing, let's say, a solution for a client and there's a new pharma regulation, um, you know, uh, that knowledge has to be translated and um, programmed in. So on one end, we try to be as secure as we possibly can, but we don't want to, on the other end, lose sight of, you know, what the customer wants and values. But, um, but we try to um, integrate security by design in the, um, all of our development processes. What has, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? No, that's it. I, I'm along that line. I'm kind of just wondering, like, what has been the response from senior executives towards data science? Like, were there any challenges that you faced when you were pushing for it? And, you know, how were you able to overcome them? So I guess, in other words, how do you make a case for business or to the business for data science? So I would say prior to ChatGPT, um, it's a, um, I would call it a ground and pound campaign <laughs> where you have to make something, um, you have to show people, okay, this is what it can do. And you have to show it as part of a, a process. So if I, you know, just do a cool machine learning use case, then um, in isolation, they'll say, oh yeah, that's nice. But how does it help um, solve a business problem? And if you go end to end from the data generation to the final you know, delivery of your results, you know, are you managing that entire chain? And um, there's cultural components. Um, so, you know, um, working internationally, you know, you're bringing up these ideas of data science and machine learning to practitioners who maybe have never been exposed to it before. Um, so there's this kind of like, can I trust what the AI is doing? How does it kind of work? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the advent of ChatGPT, um, it makes it much easier for us because unless you live under a rock, um, uh, it's everywhere in the news right now. Uh, I even saw an interview um, yesterday, okay, that uh, the CEO of Google uh, referred to AI in terms of the um, impact in humanity as the greatest thing since on the discovery of fire. <laughs> so, Everyone knows about this. They read the news, you know, they've checked out ChatGPT um, and uh, you can see it for yourself, the power. Um, and now I make the connection between AI and data science. And now uh, the, the work has gotten much easier in terms of promoting. <laughs>